Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. You know, retail, e-commerce, so many of us are selling our products online these days and that industry is changing so much that I wanted to bring a guest that could talk to that. What does it look like? Where is it going? And how can that relate to and be relevant to what it is that you're doing? So I'm really excited to have with us here today, Stephen Carl, who is the founder of Needle Movement. And initially when I saw that, I was like, needles? Okay, what is he talking about? <laughs> but it's a digital strategy company focused on conscious e-commerce and moving the needle. And uh, he came to us through Emily Kelly from Interview Connections, who introduced us. So thank you, Emily. Stephen uh, decided that his true calling was really, after many years in the industry, uh, to take part in the greater good, the emerging wave of retail brands that make a real difference through sustainability and social impact. So I'm just really excited to have him here. Stephen, welcome to Leader Transformation. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Nicole. It's great to be here. It is a pleasure to have you. And I'm just really excited to hear and personally even learn from your, like for myself, I'm, I've got, I've got questions. <laughs> <I'm ready. laughs> Excellent. Bring it. So let's start off with the landscape of retail and e-commerce, where it is right now and uh, where you fit into that as well. Excellent. So I've been, I'm going to age myself. I've been working in e-commerce since 1998. Um, and I, I started out an Amazon-funded startup that was focusing on one-hour delivery. Um, and you know, now, over 20 years later, um, I'm doing digital strategy consulting for brands. Um, I guess for you know, so for for a long time, you know, I've worked inside you know various companies and tried to build out their e-commerce strategy. And over the past few years, there's been a fascinating transformation in it where there's starting to be a build out of a brand of consumer called the conscious consumer. Now, you know, with the internet, you know, it's just like music. You can get anything you want. There's some people that like hip hop, some people like rock, some people like jazz. So there is a tribal customer too, a sect of the customer base that e-commerce, the norm was always about instant gratification. And people wanting things now, wanting things instantly. That's why Amazon Prime is so popular and how they differentiated themselves. And now with the conscious consumer, um, through brands like Tom Shoes or Everlane or Patagonia, I guess there's a, a couple of things in this phenomenon that everybody is shopping online and the shopper has so many choices now because of the internet that if you're shopping for sneakers, you know, think of how many places that you could possibly buy those sneakers at. You know, so because there's so much choice, the brands have to listen to figure out how to differentiate themselves. You know, and sometimes differentiating yourself just on price, it doesn't work because you know, someone, else, someone can always lower the price on a product. So they're trying to find different ways. And because the consumer has so much choice, they're starting to really talk about their values. Um, a, a side effect of social media where brands are constantly talking to shoppers as people is it's a two-way dialogue. And that consumer, you know, he or she, they want, they want that brand to be a person and to have, they want to buy from brands that have the same values that they do. You know, so that's how there's been some transformations now. I think a lot of us might remember the Nike Colin Kaepernick ad campaign where Nike did this big sponsorship and, and Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick was the football player who was kneeling down in stadiums um, because he was passionate about criminal justice reform. Um, and I don't, you know, it's not, I, I think the, the, the key takeaway was that Nike did it, not what they believed, because I think they looked at their marketing research and they said, my God, we, our customers want us to, you know, they think we're flat, they think we're stale, you know, we have to show our passion for something. And by showing that passion and enthusiasm, they can attract audiences. And, you know, with Nike, there's come other companies as well, but that a company that of that size would say, you know, I know we're going to, I know we might 
bother a few of our customers, but we're just going to do this anyway because it's more important to fuel the rest of our community for this. Yeah. But they're just discovering that brands are finding out that by showing their values and showing their commitment to, you know, their mission and, you know, what's, what's the purpose besides just, besides just selling stuff, you know, by showing that we're at a time where I think a lot of businesses say, well, I'd love to do that, but I can't be profitable doing it. But there's a customer that seeks that. And I think that's the real difference now that you have a certain segment that wants to support companies that are giving to charity or wants to support companies that are, that have sustainability initiatives. Well, you bring up a really great point, or as you said it, I, I thought back to it and I thought, yeah, that makes so much sense. Initially, and I'm old enough to remember when we first went online and I was actually part of an organization where we were part of our business was bringing it online. It was a big to do. And the, so the first priority was get online and to be able to have that convenience to order from your home and have it delivered to your house. Then it now what you're talking about is it's like there's choices. People can evolve and say, okay, so now that it's online, everybody's online. Now we want more choice. Now what you're saying is, and what I'm hearing is that it's now not just about those two, those two things, because those are kind of like a givens that it's now more about, okay, who are you? What are you, what is the purpose behind your company and your brand? And so the, the, the story oftentimes in business and in also some of the people that were maybe a little older like me, you know, we can get into ruts, right? And we're like, oh, okay, we got it. It's like SEO, you know? Oh, we got it. We figured it out. We know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. For the moment until Google starts changing things and then it's all, you know, you got to learn it again. So same thing here. It's always evolving. The business is always transforming. And so to be able to adapt to those changing yes, requirements. Definitely. Yeah. And I notice also when you talk about like the, the shoppers, people are just becoming more conscious now. You know, I, like I, when I shop on Amazon, I shop through smile because I know that I'm not just shopping directly through Amazon. If I do great, they make money, whatever I get my product. But if I do it through smile, then the organization that I, the charity that I have identified that I want the money to go to gets a portion of it as well. So why wouldn't I, if I'm going to get the same product and it's going to cost me the same amount, why wouldn't I do it through that? And that makes you want to shop at Amazon because you know you can get that. You know you can help your charity through it as well. Yes. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about what, um, so what's the percentage of the population, if you know that, that is really, that this is really important for them. Like, and that's growing, I know. But mm -hmm. like, where is it at right now? How, how important is it today uh, to be able to make that change? And then how do they make that change? So you can, we know about greenwashing, right? It's like, yay, yeah, we're all about it. Talking it, but actually not really living it. Kind of doing it as a marketing angle, as opposed yes. to a heartfelt commitment that they have and a belief that is actually ingrained at the level of culture within their brand. Yeah, I think with, um, so the, as a percentage of the population, I have to throw a dart on this one, but I would say, I would say it's probably around 15% right now, but you have different shades of it. You have people that are very passionate about it. Um, and then you have people that are more influenced by it as more and more companies start going this route of, I mean, look at how quickly plastic pollution and the backlash against it has gone mainstream. You know, so there are people that are, you know, going to have zero plastic in their, in their household. And they're ones that are just like really thinking about it now. They're very mindful of it. And they're saying, okay, well, how do I reduce my plastic consumption by 50% and start using reusable things. So I would say it's like 15% is the, the people that are in it. And then there's another 15% that are on the cusp that give it a little time. And now they're not, now, now they're in 
social groups that are activating it. And even when you're on Instagram or other social platforms, there's very large communities that are also supporting this as well. You know, so, so you've got that bell curve. And so that's where the indicate, that's why I was curious because you've got that, you can kind of see where I always forget the name of it, but you yes. know what I'm talking about, right? That yes. is innovation curve. Mm -hmm. And so you've got those early adopters. And when you hit a tipping point, it's like, it changes from there. And it's somewhere around that number, 15, 16. There is, so it definitely fits in. There are, there are large communities and you know, a good example is Allbirds, the New Zealand shoe company. Um, and they have a, their valuation right now is $1.4 billion. And I had um, never heard of them. So, so they are, yeah. wow. But there's, and there's, yeah, so there's, and, and companies like Patagonia as well are, mm -hmm. or Warby Parker, um, they're involved in, they're a B corporation. So there's, you know, they're involved in, in mission as well, but it's, you know, so it, 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 there is large enough audiences to support, you know, you know, support these things. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess with, I know you were, okay, so we were talking about greenwashing and marketing, and this is very true. And this is what, you know, people have very good BS detect detectors these days, especially younger audiences, and they can smell an ad from a mile away. And I think when people... The mindset really should be about, I don't think the consumer expects perfection from organizations, you know, like um, they expect progress, you know, because we're not, even with sustainability, it's, it's very, you know, there's so many things that impact it, but they want, they want to work with companies that are thinking about it and thinking on how they can do better. Like sometimes you could make the most sustainable product, but it would cost 25 times the amount. So it's not realistic or feasible from a business perspective, but it's, you know, how do you move the needle forward and make progress on an annual basis? So that's what the, the consumer is looking at. But yeah, like, you know, greenwashing and marketing and, and shady marketing claims, um, I, th I think it's just about being authentic with the consumer and that if that happens, people will, you know, it is possible about being called out on it. You know, that's an example. Will... What would be an example of greenwashing? Okay. I'll give you an example from at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, so I have, you know, so I'm, I'm vegetarian and my partner is vegan. And so just to explain that, you know, vegan is, you know, no, no meat and no dairy products, you know, and my, my mother was wonderful because she, we asked to get a vegan butter. Um, so, and she went to the supermarket and she found, you know, a product that was vegan butter. And she found it very easily because it said it's vegan very, you know, very prominently on the package. Um, then we were looking at the ingredients and we found out that there was palm oil, a couple of other things that just weren't really sustainable ingredients. So technically it was vegan. And this is the whole problem with vegan in a way, because just because you eat an ice cream that's vegan, it's not good for you. I mean, there, there's plenty of crap that's, right. it's great that it's vegan from that perspective, but I think there's a false impression that it's healthy for you as well. Right. But anyway, so with this butter product, we felt like we were greenwashed because it said very clearly vegan, but it didn't espouse the values that go with it. You know? right, so that's, right. And it could also be someone that it's kind of like you're highlighting your good side, but not showing your bad side. Um, so it's possible that a, a fashion company could use some sustainable products in what, like they could have one product that's sustainable and then everything else isn't. So, you know, it's, it's not, everyone has to make progress. So it's not, you know, but I think if that company were really showcasing their commitment to sustainability, then the, the conscious consumer would not be as, they would want to see more of a commitment from the brand. Yeah. You know? I noticed I, it for myself, like when things say all natural or, you know, and yes. then you read the ingredients. And all natural I, isn't a regulated term. It's that's not the, a regulated term. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so you're thinking this is not all natural. You put it on the label and because you wanted to attract that audience, but that's it. Or the other thing is like you go through the, 
let's say the, the veg, the veggie section, you know, and here you've got, uh, you've got like talk about single use plastics and, yes. and veg, you know, the, the, cause I like spinach and the, the greens and so forth. And so, but they come in these box, these, these containers and I'm like, okay, so it's organic, it's this, it's that. And it's in a single pl use plastic container. Why is that necessary? You know? And so there's, there's all these different, you know, and I think people are starting to become more and more aware of that as people who are passionate are talking about it and saying, Hey, there's another solution to it. So yeah. Yeah. Really good. So what's the playbook? Like if we want to make that change, even for like looking at our own companies and saying, how do we know, because I don't think that companies necessarily intend Absolutely. all the time to do that. Right. Like they, they're like, Hey, we're, we've got this awesome product and we want to deliver it. And we need these, you know, we just, we just let's, for example, with the single use plastics, which I know is a passionate topic of yours is, um, just a way that they deliver their product. They don't think much of it. And, and yet, you know, there's other things, there, there are other options. So how, how do you, where do you, where do you start with that? Yes. I, and I, I think it doesn't, I don't want to imply that there's this ultra high bar that people have, they, that have to have. Everyone starts somewhere. And I think the consumer rewards progress. Um, in regards to the playbook, you know, the marketing playbook for mission-driven brands is a lot of it goes with, you know, branding is all about storytelling. So it gives us something to talk about besides just product or buy my stuff, you know, and that's, what's nice about it. So it's, it's about, and, and I think, you know, like you were, you know, you were saying brands are, brands are already involved in this. Like, you know, we've, you know, brands are already involved with charities. I think a lot of it is just calibrating it into a clear message to the buyer where you say, these are the things that I'm passionate about. And from time to time, that can be mentioned in your marketing collateral, you know, where, you know, so with social media, you know, if you're posting messages about your service, your product, then, you know, maybe once every three weeks, once a month, there's a message that's just about what you're passionate about as an organization. Um, it could be a case study of something that your organization has done. You know, so all these, so in these marketing touch points, I think for a, a website, the about us page, and even the homepage is important where um, I've seen a lot of bad about us pages where it's, it's like the, it's like the last page that companies really think about because there's so many other, like they have to upload all their products and they have to do their marketing. And, you know, so I feel the pain there, but with about us is a, is it really a chance to not only tell your bio, but to say the things that you're passionate about and, and the causes. And then, you know, on a product page, for example, of a website, and that's, you know, the product page would be if I'm selling jeans, that's where the add to cart button it is, is that's where the copy is and where people make that buying decision. You know, for a sustainability company, as an example is, a sustainable jeans company would tell a story about, here's where the jeans were made. They were made in a clean denim mill um, and they would, you know, they could have things called um, seals and badges and a badge is just like a, you know, it would just be a, you know, just like free shipping with a little truck that could be a trust badge um, for a beauty brand cruelty free or vegan could be a trust badge that goes onto the website, but just a little quick way to communicate. We're not just thinking about, you know, we're, we're thinking about these other issues outside of just the product and the price. So I like that. So from a practical standpoint for, okay, what do we do with this information? So on the about page, and you mentioned also the homepage, but the about page is to talk about what the company, the bio and everything, but also what the company is passionate about. And then on product pages, that's where you can dive into the specifics of uh, for that particular product that you're actually putting badges on each, each product. I like it. That's good. Yeah. I mean, also with email subscriptions, um, whenever someone signs up for email, there's a, a, a sequence that is called the welcome series, you know, so people sign up and then that's your chance to tell everyone 
all about you and the things that differentiate your company. So often people will put, you know, what makes what their what makes their product special and a popular strategy is a letter from the founder. Or just in a quick note, as the founder of the organization, you're just sending a message to that person that subscribed that they're important and that you're listening to them. Because I think another thing like you were saying about, you know, the um, your discovery with plastic is as brands, we learn so much from the shopper themselves on what they like and what they don't like. So having that really open channel of communication as the owner of a business or a founder um, is great to get that feedback. Because if people, if you do, you know, if you, if there's an element of your product, the blind spots are the scariest things in businesses where there's a problem yet you don't know about it, you know, because that's, so nobody wants to tell you. Right. And, you know, you want, you want to, you know, I, I, I just see this as a great trade in leadership where people just send me, you know, I had a, I had a friend who's starting another podcast and, you know, really bright person. And he was like, I want to hear everything that's terrible about my podcast. Tell it to me now. And because he was so open to that feedback, I let him have it. <laughs> and, and not that it was, um, it was the, the quality was great, but you always, you know, you're always trying to find out how to make it even better. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and to your point there, you do have a podcast. We want to make sure we mention that that'll be in the show notes as well. The needle movement podcast. Um, so let's actually talk about that email marketing. Uh, I know there's some people that say it's dead. Some people say that it's very much alive and it's like, you kind of get opinions on either spectrum on that, but there's also, um, so I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Uh, But also I'm curious, like you mentioned about this sequence. I know that like for myself, you go, okay, so I'm not one for fluff. I'm not one for sending messages. Like I don't feel inspired to write copy and I know I can hire somebody to do it, but the point of putting out copy just for the sake of, you know, making it fluffy and, you know, try to engage people, but it's really, it's just more about throwing out content there rather than something that I really meaningful, meaningfully want to say, Hey, I really want to share this with, this is really important. I want to share this with you. It's like, we almost feel like nowadays it's like, we need to just put out content. You know, <laughs> if you listen to Gary Vee, it's like content every day. I need, I need to just get it out there. <laughs> I need to get, get out there. And it's like, yeah, okay. So you may be top of mind, but what are you top of mind for? And, and is that the best use of your time? I don't know. So can you talk about how that first sequence, because you brought it up, that first sequence, what would be a great, like if you were to work with a, a client, and I know you do this, um, but to, just to give us kind of a, a framework for it, if you work with a client, you say, okay, this is what I recommend that you, you know, that your sequence look like. Okay. So for the key with, um, so uh, for a welcome series email, and that's just when people sign up, I, I guess the key is really, you want to identify the top reasons that people don't use your product or service. And when you can find those out, then your email becomes the answer to them. You know, so if people don't, if people are concerned about price, you can address that. Or let's just say with, with e-commerce, if people are concerned about the sustainability, then, you know, you, you, you have a long conversation about that. But the, so that's, you know, in terms of, I mean, I'll give you an e-commerce sequence. So we talked about you know, you know, the first email could be just a, you know, celebrating the sign up in the community um, and getting also getting people to sign up to other social channels because you want to get people signed up to multiple channels. And that's that's a goal always, because if you're if they're signed up to, say, Instagram and email, they're just more engaged with your message than if they're only signed up to one channel. OK, um, so let's see. So then there's the letter to the founder. Talk about how your product is made. Talk about this, you know, you know, talk about the service you offer and give some detail. Um, a lot of people like to do social proof, which is re- customer reviews, where you just, you know, if you get, you know, you showcase the, the testimonials you have or any five-star reviews that are there. Um, you know, and then you can also, if you have, 
best selling or most popular products, you can feature them in a welcome series. Um, going back to the, um, the, the debate about email, email is alive and well. And I think I know this because just the last holiday season, the retailers were killing it on email. Um, I think the reason why is because, you know, we, we do hear a lot, and we were talking about this a little before, brands are all about stories and storytelling. And I think I've heard this so much as, a, as an agency that I want to throw something against the wall how many times people say the storytelling thing. But I, I think here's, how, here's where it's evolving. Brands want to have conversations with customers. And email is just the tool. It's just the way that you have that conversation. And it's, it's, you know, it's just the medium, just like it could be on text messaging as well. People have, you know, but it's, it's a very fluid communication channel. And that's why email is doing very well. So the reason why I know that email is not dying is because I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing retailers make anywhere from 15 X to hundred X on their investment in email. You know, so just from, from those pure numbers, I know that even though our inboxes are very crowded, it's still working very well for companies. So with that, it's interesting because I, um, I was thinking back to when email first came in mm -hmm. and we started doing it. It was kind of like a, and maybe this was the wrong approach, but it was kind of like a broadcast, right? So like you're talking about having a conversation that's much different than broadcasting information. So when I get emails in my inbox, I'm usually like delete, 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 but there are some of them that I will always read and there it's because it's different. Sometimes it is a broadcast like, Hey, I have a cat. So Petco says, yep. here's a, here's the latest deal, you know, or here's what's going on. Right. And you might want to take advantage of this or it's a coupon or something like that. Awesome. I'm going to take a look at that. The other one, you know, other ones are where it's uh, valuable information, inspiration or something like that. And I'm like, Ooh, I love that. It's short. It's succinct Joel Osteen's. And I, it's one of the few that I will read every single day. And if I don't get time to read it right away, I will, um, speaking of my cat, that was my cat sneezing. Um, I will leave it in my inbox and I'll read it later. And so, because it's a value to me, but then there are so many others like 98% or 99% yep. of the rest of them that are just trying to sell me something. They're broadcasting. Like I said, something that's like, Hey, buy my thing. And, and that's where I just, I'm like, delete, 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 or here's my event that can look differently. Right. So here's my event, sign up for my event, uh, download my ebook da You know, why do I want to do that? I don't want any more information. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I, I love, I forget who said it to attribute it to them. Uh, but it was great. They said, you know, I don't know anybody who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, today I would like another free ebook. Like that's my goal for today. Nobody wants that. They want the, they may want the information, but they don't, they're not, their goal isn't, Hey, I need this new thing, this other thing, more information. Yay. Right. Make my life simpler. Right. Yeah, Make it, it provide value. Yes. I think it's, it's all about, yeah. Cause it's, it's hard for, I think it's hard for all of us because we want to sell like you're, you're, we all have to make a living, you know, we, you know, and, and profit is very important to every business. So it's, there is that time to push product, but I think it's just whatever you're creating, it's really, you got to see it from the perspective of the recipient. And I mean, I'll give you a quick example. I have a client who, um, a, a client, which is a plant store, like a big plant store in, in like in the New York area. And we were thinking about email strategy and their goal is to sell plants. So, you know, so you, there will be promotional emails about plants. But now we're getting more nuanced about it. And we're saying, well, these people that are receiving these emails, they're not going to buy plants every week. But what do they need? They're all taking care of their plants. So let's give them plant care tips, things that will add value that's related to us. And then the next time they need a plant, they'll, you know, they'll appreciate those tips and the value that was brought and come back to, you know, come back to us instead of other options that they have. You know, but that it's just... Sense. Yeah. Like how to deliver that value. Yeah. So it's looking, what I'm hearing is, is then, and it may sound so simple, but yet how many of us don't do that, right? Is looking at the broader perspective 
I have coaching services. Let me, let me give you tips on that you can use and you can apply right now. But even looking beyond that, that box that we oftentimes will put ourselves in and saying, what else can we provide that could, that could be beneficial uh, to them, even just in the way that they're thinking or whether it's mindset or business or whatever it is like you talking about digital strategy, how do you do it? That's a good, good question. How do you actually engage with your, your audience given that you have a product, which is like a digital strategy, very, right. very uh, technical, if you will, product. Right. It's right. It's more abstract. Yes. Um, so I have to, I, I think a key thing is, is to. And a lot of people uh, are selling it. That's true. Yeah. So, so the um, asking your audience, I think is, is a very good thing. So how I mean, do you do that? You could even, you just send them a, so th this is another trick with email marketing that's interesting is a lot of times people are now sending text only emails. They're not sending like blasts with logos and pictures. They are broadcasting a quick question that looks just like an email that a friend would send to another friend and saying, mm -hmm. what's the next topic? What, what topics are you interested about? Or like in e-commerce, I've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of people do this where they say, What's your most burning question in e-commerce? What's your most burning question? Like, what should I talk about next? Um, because that is really that's the that's the magic stuff where it's just that's what the that's what you want to you you we spend so much time on content we it needs to be based on what they what their problems are what their pain points are so that's I mean that's something that I do where I just periodically, I just send a quick email to people and say, what'd you think of that? Because uh, the feedback loop is really important. Um, and it, it makes, because I think you were talking about the, how much time you know it takes and people getting overwhelmed by content. Personally, I'm not posting on social media on a daily basis. I think people have to do what they're comfortable about because it's better to create good content on a less frequent basis than daily, which is fine, than to create mediocre content that's not going to hit everyone because we feel like we're required to. You know, but yeah, that's, that's, what... a, that's a great point because it's that required the obligation. I noticed for myself, if when I felt like I have to put this out, mm -hmm. then my energy is my my yep. my inspiration's not in it, my energy's not in it, and it usually falls flat, even if it's really good it usually falls flat. It's just like there's, a, there's not this connection with the audience. But what you said there, it kind of brings me back to even being a trainer and speaking on stage and facilitating. So a lot of people think they need to deliver the content, right? I'm there, they hired me, invited me in, whatever, to come and to deliver some knowledge and some content to the audience. When in fact, the a facilitator is very different in that the, facilit the facilitator brings value and content, but actually engages the audience in the dialogue and co-creates something together. So the discovery actually can come, a lot of it can come from the room itself. And so what I'm hearing is the same thing, applying that to email, applying that to social media where you're actually engaging them and it's actually less work it's less burdened than me trying to figure out what do they want to hear about? Let me think, let me brainstorm on that. Let me go meditate at the beach about that. <laughs> Why don't I just ask them? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's nice when you can also, I mean, I have, you know, for me, uh, I was an English major. So uh, for a long time, I didn't want to hire a copywriter or bring someone in because it was a pride thing for me. So I'm like, I, you know, I should be able to do this. I went to college for this. And I've had a great experience working with copywriters after that pride was went through because sometimes I would just put in a, a rough draft of what I was trying to say. And then the professional would make it stronger and really get to that vision that I wanted. Um, and, you know, I think it's sometimes with our, our things, it's not that we have to replace roles, but sometimes finding collaborators can help us along the way. And what's nice about the gig economy is you're not 
you don't need to, the cost can be much lower um, to find some good relationships that allow you to scale the content that you're creating. Because I know with content, yes, it can be totally overwhelming. Um, and I had a wonderful experience with a speech, you know, um, making an appearance at a conference where, you know, I started, I did a rough draft, my copywriter worked with me on it. And we got to a version that we were both very happy with and that I probably would, I wouldn't have been able to do it myself. Yeah. I have a question for you. Needle movement. Why'd you call it that? Well, it is a variation of move the needle. Um, and just because that's always been my focus with my, my passion has been with, you know, I knew coming out of school that I wasn't going, I didn't want to work you know, at a large company. And that, that was just my preference, but I was just very passionate about entrepreneurs and helping them, you know, get through things. But to me, after working in, you know, from the various roles that I've had, I was never that concerned with what caused the impact. And I think in digital marketing, we have these silos and these problems sometimes where we're trying to credit one thing with the sale. Like, did the email do it? Did social media do it? Did the website do it? When who cares from the owner's perspective, where it's like what actually brought the business forward? So I think that's where needle movement comes in, where it's like, I don't care what works. I just want to find the thing that works for the business that allows them to take that next step. Got it. So what for your clients, you mentioned about email, creating the sequence and so forth. What are some of the products and services that you provide for them who you work with like as an yes. example so i so i'm working mostly within e-commerce and it's it's providing digital strategy like for some brands it's just how to identify those big marketing wins and also how not to make those rookie mistakes um because there sometimes are, are large costs that go with that you know so it's identifying a marketing plan and then you know for other clients i've just you know, I actually got a lot of great feedback from my clients that some people want to have that business coach. Other people want someone to just do it for them. So that's where, that's how Needle Movement got involved with email marketing services. Because sometimes I, I understand that the founder, the head of marketing, they can be completely overwhelmed and the time that you can save so that um, they can focus on all the other hats that they have to wear in the business can be incredibly valuable. So you know, that's where we offer email marketing services and just going towards that vision of conversational commerce. The reason why I like email, SMS, and those elements are because you already have people signed up to a list. So they've already indicated interest. And that's the low hanging fruit where, you know, you can make, by making a large return on investment in those areas, it just positions you so well to scale that you have something that's rinse, repeat revenue. And then you can move on to the other things. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and with that, then of course, um, there's also a uh, time frame in which you need to engage them and so forth. Can you talk about how long it takes? I know that there used to be a uh, used to be a saying that you know you need to have seven to ten touches, right, yes. before somebody's ready to buy. What is it like nowadays where people will like so somebody starts a does a sequence? How long does a sequence need to be? in order for somebody on average, does how long does it take for somebody to actually engage by your product at some point? Mm -hmm. uh, these days it can be, I've heard 15 touches as a, as a benchmark for just all the interactions that someone would have to make. One could be an email, one could be social media, one could be the website. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, I mean, they call these nurture campaigns, you know, but it doesn't, it, it really depends on the product and the cost. Like if it's a, it's a higher ticket item, then that will require more research and more consideration, you know, but a lot of it is just how to get those touches. Like one touch could be a press, you know, a, a great PR, you know, um, a great art, an article in a well-known publication. Another touch could be email among mm -hmm. other things, you know, but so, it takes, I think it's, or it takes time, you know, I it think it's just, time, you know, yeah. It doesn't, none of these things are, I wish, I wish it were quicker sometimes, but I think also with these interactions, they're tests and with that feedback loop, because there's always friction in the process. So 
you know, there's that thing called product market fit and niche, which is a product market fit is like your audience is enthusiastic about the product you're offering. So if they're not enthusiastic, you got to find out why so that it's, it's simpler, but it's just that constant, like trial and error in a way of test of testing and interacting with the consumer. Got it. Thank you. So what, if they listen to your podcast, what are they going to learn from following you? Okay. Um, the podcast. What are you talking on, about? I don't know. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah. So the Needle Movement podcast, um, it focuses on e-commerce, entrepreneurship. And we do give, we also do focus on mission-driven and sustainable brands as well and do interviews with founders and businesses that are involved with that. So try to have a slew of topics. Um, you know, that I think also is just important to stay ahead of trends. So, you know, I think you were talking about newsletters you know, I, I, and that's what we're trying to do, I think, with that's why I think podcasts are such an amazing source of information that you just get all this intel that you would you wouldn't hear otherwise. And like sometimes with media, it doesn't work as well to deliver that. So that's what we provide as well. Just trying to keep brands at least six to 12 months ahead of what's going mainstream and all these things, just so that we can, like you said, adapt to things before they disrupt our businesses. Hmm. That's great. Actually, I was just going to ask you and say, what is your, like, if there is a, a message that you, one message that you would want to share with the world, like that is, that is like, they really need to know this message <laughs> from your perspective. What is that? A message. This is a good one. A message to share with all the, I think it's, you know, I'll, I'll go, the, I'll take a different route on this and say, I just think your habits as an entrepreneur are the biggest thing that are going to drive the success of your initiatives and that whatever hurdles that people are, are hitting, you know, that just, try, you know, you try to reverse engineer the goals that you have and how you can get around them, you know, cause habits, you know, like I, I've gone through a certain exploration on, you know, things like the, you know, just blocking out time so that I can focus on one thing and not feel like, you know, you have to do a lot of other things, but just being able to focus on one initiative. Um, the Pomodoro technique, which is when you set aside 30 minutes, take out all the distractions from your phone, the web, and focus on the most important task at hand. You know, you figure out those two most important things in your business that have to get done hell or high water. and really prioritize them and hold yourself accountable on a weekly basis to do that. Cause I think it's really an extension of, you know, we talk about the new year's resolution and I love new year's resolutions and, you know, but it has to be quicker for businesses. Cause we want to know if things are working or not on a monthly basis, not an annual basis. And that allows you to make progress quicker. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Big believer in habits and consistency. And certainly as you're talking about a digital strategy, you got to have consistency. So one last question. If a company is looking and deciding where do I want to put my focus? Like where's my leading strategy? Which one is my leading strategy? Or is it, is there a leading strategy? But you know, like sometimes we think that we need to do all of it yep. and you get so divided just to your point about focusing in on what's the absolute thing that needs to happen. That's what made me think of this is like, what are the things that if you were to start off and say, okay, what's my leading strategy, how would they identify their leading strategy? Um, yeah, I think that goes into looking at your analytics and looking at your numbers and seeing, I, I believe that brands can optimize things often that something that's, you know, that they'll see some progress, but they're not getting enough. So it's not always a new channel. It can also be optimizing a current channel. You know, I think email- Yeah, one is, that has potential that they're just not maximizing. Yes, but it's, it depends on the business, but I think the, the one or two places where you're seeing the most leads and the most revenue coming from, look at those closely and figure out how you can do even better. You know, like with email, there's the, like with email, a lot of times brands are doing well with it, but 
They don't have, like for instance, they don't have a welcome series set up or they don't have automation set up. So they could even be getting more sales on it, but they're satisfied with what they have. You know, but I think a lot of this is just really hone in on that number one and number two and then figure out how you can do it even better. Because it could be, it could be a technology thing. It could be a staffing thing. It could be also like you're the leader of the business and you're sending out the email. And if someone else was doing it, they could send four times the amount. So there's a lot, you know, but I think it's honing in on the things that are already, you're already getting an indication that these things sort of work. Yeah. You know, so you're not yeah. flying yeah. blind and just believing someone else that it'll work for you. I mean, so those what about the, a brand new company? How do they find that? Great question. A brand new company, I think brand new companies have to do even more feedback than older companies because you're, you're flying, like you don't know. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uncertain things. So I think with brand new, like, with new companies setting up focus groups of, you know, uh, you know, you got to start out with a community of people that you can ask a lot of questions to about that. And from them, they're going to tell you, here's the media that I use. These are the publications that I read. Um, and you'll, you have to find out what media they consume. By finding that, like, you know, so it's, it's finding out the, you know, the product market fit and what message is going to be most powerful, but it's what message and then what media that you can access them at. Yeah. It reminds me of like, as a business coach, talking to clients and saying, okay, who is your ideal audience and mm -hmm. where do they hang out? Yep. And that's it. And finding that. And then, like you said, bringing that feedback in and saying, okay, so what do you listen to? What do you like? What do you don't like? How are we doing all of that feedback then? comes into play. Steven, yeah, it's, it's been like, great. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's been wonderful being on. I, I appreciate being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. And we'll make sure that the links to your website, needlemovement.com, also the um, podcast that you have, the Needle Movement podcast, we'll make sure the link is uh, available for people to connect with you there and of course on social media. And so we just really appreciate you being here. And I would encourage our listeners, I believe that leaders of transformation take action. And so take action on something today. Maybe it's looking at your digital strategy. Maybe it's even before then putting time in your calendar to look at your digital strategy, scheduling time, because it's important. You can work in your business. Many people have heard that already that working in, working on their business, but uh, too often, even though we know that uh, too often entrepreneurs are working in their business so much that they don't take the time to work on their business, to step back, be the observer and say, where do I need to make changes? Where are the opportunities? Like Steven said, you know, where are the opportunities that maybe we haven't maximized those opportunities? We have some analytics. We show that there's some, some traction there, but if we were just to dial it up to move the needle, right? Just a little bit, it would make all the difference for our business or a new business. If you're just starting out and you're thinking, I don't even know where to begin is to identify and saying, who's my audience that, you know, and where do they hang out and, and then start there and start testing and measuring, peppering those different arenas and seeing which one works and, and picks up uh, traction. So I encourage you that we'd love to hear your stories. If you have questions, certainly you can reach out to uh, Steven directly. Uh, or you can reach us through our website at leadersoftransformation.com. We'd also love to hear your stories, how you're making an impact in the world, how you're doing business and doing it in a way that is for good. And so uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us through our website. You can, of course, find us on social media as well. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we appreciate you being here. We we'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.